What's up, friends? This week on The Change Law, we invited our good friend, Matt Ryer, to join us for some good conversation about some Git tooling that's been on our radar. You may know Matt from GoTime and also Grafana's Big Tent, which we help to produce. We speculate, we discuss, we laugh, and Matt even breaks in the song a few times. It's some good fun. A tremendous thank you to our friends and our partners at Fastly and Fly. Our pods are fast to download globally because Fastly, they are fast all over the world. Learn more at Fastly.com. And our friends at Fly help us put our app and our database close to our users all over the world. No ops required. Check them out at fly.io. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Fly. Fly lets you deploy full stack apps and databases close to your users, and they make it too easy. No ops are required. And I'm here with Chris McCord, the creator of Phoenix Framework for Elixir and staff engineer at Fly. Chris, I know you've been working hard for many years to remove the complexity of running full stack apps in production. So now that you're at Fly solving these problems at scale, what's the challenge you're facing? One of the challenges we've had at Fly is getting people to really understand the benefits of running close to a user, because I think... As developers, we internalize as a CDN, people get it. They're like, oh, yeah, you want to put your JavaScript close to a user and your CSS. But then for some reason, we have this mental block when it comes to our applications. And I don't know why that is. And getting people past that block is really important because a lot of us are privileged that we we live in North America and we deploy 50 millisecond hop away. So things feel fast. Like when GitHub, maybe they're deploying regionally now, but for the first 12 years of their existence, GitHub worked great if you lived in North America. If you lived in Europe or anywhere else in the world, you had to hop over the ocean and it was actually a pretty slow experience. So one of the things with Fly is it runs your app code close to users. So it's the same mental model of like, hey, it's really important to put our images and our CSS close to users. But like, what if your app could run there as well? API requests could be super fast. What if your data was replicated there? Database requests could be super fast. So I think the challenge for Fly is to get people to understand that the CDN model maps exactly to your application code. And it's even more important for your app to be running close to a user because it's not just requesting a file. It's like your data and saving data to disk, fetching data for disk, that all needs to live close to the user for the same reason that your JavaScript assets should be close to a user. Very cool, thank you, Chris. So if you understand why you CDN, your CSS and your JavaScript, then you understand why you should do the same for your full stack app code. And Fly makes it too easy to launch most apps in about three minutes. Try it free today at fly.io. Again, fly.io. Recently, we've been overwhelmed by a lot of the crazy, super cool tools, innovation, and just stuff that people have been doing in and around Git, whether it's the Git project itself or tooling built around it. It feels like there's something new every single week in ChangeLog News. So we thought we'd get together with our friend, Matt Ryer, who also happens to be a co-host of the GoTime podcast and of Grafana's Big Tent podcast, which is an award-winning podcast. Woo-hoo. And GoTime is an award-worthy podcast. <laughs> yeah. And we thought we would just introduce some of these tools mm. and ideas to everyone and just talk about them. So, Matt, thanks for being here. Oh, thank you very much. I use Git a lot, uh, so I'm very keen to learn more about this. W- would you say daily or weekly? Uh, depends if it's every day or every week. Okay, yeah. explain. Well, if you want to say something happens once a day, you'd say daily. <laughs> but if it, if it only happens once every seven days, I'd probably opt for weekly. The confusing one is bi-weekly. Yes. Because that can both mean twice a week and once every other week. Two different meanings. Who invented that phrase? Yeah, it's not good, is it? We have fortnightly as well as a term to mean two weeks. I like yeah. fortnight. Not the game, but the phrase. Yeah. The game kind of soiled the phrase, if you ask me, the word. Yeah. Because now there's two contexts. Yeah. Quake did that to me. I used to love quakes. And then... <laughs> <laughs> like earthquakes? <laughs> no, no, you're like, wait, no. is it the game? No, it's, it's like the oldest game in the world, though, isn't it? It's like it's right up there with uh, Pong, Duke Nukem. Yeah, Pong. Sure. Yeah, we used to play on uh, like in school. We had a LAN party, and Quake Two was the game we played. And then I used to make levels with my brother using Worldcraft, 
uh, 3D world builder thing. And it was so much nice. fun yeah, to be able to like build levels and then play them with your mates was just couldn't believe you could do that. These land parties, did you take a router with you or a router with you? And did you pick up your entire gigantic tower PC <laughs> and take it with you? Like Describe. Yeah. Well, luckily these were in the school library. So, okay. yeah, because we didn't, yeah, you wouldn't move your computer around back then. It's not like now with your phone, like, right. you know, can't, you can't really believe that. The internet is your land. Yeah, exactly. So the cloud. Mm -hmm. That would be dangerous if the whole internet was all on one land. Mm. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't we be pretty exposed? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, gnats are nice. Again, two contexts for gnats, especially when you're just saying the word out loud. Yeah. Let's loop back to Git. Hmm. How often do you use Git, Matt? Uh, daily or weekly. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is interesting because you haven't been coding this much lately. Mm. This is a change for you. Don't out him, Jared. Maybe not recently. Well, no offense. I want to ask him for permission first. No offense. <laughs> is yeah. this is that private information that you, you're more of a, a leader now? Um, well, I'm hoping to get one day promoted back to being an IC so I can do work again. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't use Git. I, but honestly, I kind of like, Git was always really complicated to me. And I was like, oh, there's so much you can do. And it's really quite complicated. So I try to always just use the absolute minimum that I could get away with, with it. And so that's why I quite like to get flow that used to give you like that, mm -hmm. a workflow where you could, you know, give you an, a reason to create a branch, you do your work, then you merge it back in. And yeah, so I always would err on the side of keeping it as simple as possible because there's so much you can do with Git. Yeah, absolutely. And so we're going to talk through some of these tools. And as we go, one of the things that's interesting to me, obviously not do you use these tools because, you know, unlikely because there's so many things and you like to keep it simple, but Having looked at it, seen what it does, thought about it a little bit, like are these things that we, you, me, Adam, might adopt, might try, or is it just a cool kind of triviality that's neat to look at and then move on? So let's let's dive into it a little bit. Let's look at the first one, which it's got that visual aid. It's called Git Heat Map. Mm. And this immediately reminded me of like Daisy Disk or these tools where they search your hard disk. Mm -hmm. And they show you where the big files are and they kind of put a, a map out of wherever the big files are, where, where most of your storage is across the, the span of your disk. Only this is doing it on your Git repo. Is it still file size that it's representing? It's based on diff activity. So it's using, like, it's showing you kind of like, what do you call it? Lines of code that are churn, that churn a lot mm. or like the hot files. So it's based on the history and you can also do it to limit to certain users and stuff in the history. Mm -hmm. So the example that is out there in the image as provided is on CPython, which is a, you know, a project that has a long history of commits and it's highlighting the files that Guido Van Rossum changed the most. Mm. And so it shows you a layout of that and like, you know, bright red is obviously the hottest, which is configure and then the doc folder and then test and live. So some of these things are kind of, I don't know, they're the ones that you would guess but I wonder if there's actually insights that you'd find like, holy cow, this particular file, which I found over time in certain repos, there's like certain files that are the really active ones. Yeah. And lots of people mm -hmm. touching that file. And there's other ones that, you know, actually config is kind of surprising to me, but maybe inside Python, it's different than what I'm thinking of. Mm. So you've got the you've got two dimensions here though. You've got the size of the box and you've also got the color of how red it is. So do we know what they are? What what's the size mean? And versus the what's the you know the color's obviously the most changed, I guess. So but what makes something bigger or smaller? Or is it also just the same thing? It might be by look by the look of it. Well, it says you can choose the hue that you want the chart to use for highlighting. Highlighting what though is probably like the size of the maybe the activity. Uh, maybe this is something you can actually fine tune what it actually is representing. I find tools like this are like, how do you use them? What makes them insightful? Like, is it an individual using it? Is a is it a engineering manager sort of looking at you know to sort of get because they're they're less in the code. Maybe you can speak to this, Matt, because you're less in the code lately. You're less in the details, and so maybe you use something like this as a way to sort of like grok the bigger picture. You know, yeah. Or maybe this is great for a presentation to you know. The Linux kernel, for example, and you're at 
Linux Conf. I don't even know if that's a real thing or not, but like hmm. some sort of conference focused on Linux. Like how how fast is Linux moving? What is changing within the Linux kernel? Who's doing it? Etc. Yeah, I can't imagine the amount of stress that goes on trying to do the presentations at Linux Conf though. Like trying to just connect to the projectors with Linux machines. No thanks. Yeah, it's an absolute shame. Well, you have to use the non-free packages and whatnot to do that. So that may be against the rules to the conference even. Like somebody's like a super free software person. They're like, no way, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to use it. Yeah, I went to FOSDEM recently and uh, that's obviously open source uh, and they're kind of yep. allergic to having totally uh, anything that's not open source focused of course there but it's really nice but one use case i could think for the git heat map is to make sure that you are you have good test coverage on the things that are changing the most because in a way that's where you need more stability right the, where the way you're changing the most so i feel like a kind of mashup of that and test coverage could be very useful to see are we definitely covering these things that we are editing all the time? Yeah. Maybe. I can also see it when you're coming to a new project that's existed for a long time and you're just trying to familiarize yourself with the project, mm. who's working on what, yeah, and which files are working on the most. So I did look up the way that this thing works. And so it's a two-step process. So it basically scans through the entire Git history using Git log. And it takes that history and compiles a few database tables uh, which tracks files, commits, the author, and then the relationships between those things. And then the second step is taking that database, querying it to create the tree map, and the query is based on both the size of the file and then the total number of changes to the file. So there's your two dimensions. Mm -hmm. And so the color, I think, is based on how hot it is, meaning how often it changes, and you can limit that to certain authors, like I said. And then the size of it in the actual tree map is mm. how big the file is or the folder structure is. Mm. I think I would only use it in that context as I would, if I'm like new to a team and I have a repo, maybe it has years in history. I want to quickly familiarize myself with it. You know, running the test is a good first start. And then maybe just throwing this thing in there, depending on how long it takes to operate, you know, you can get a tree map real quick. I know I've also done like clocks, the LOC, count the lines of code. And that will spit out kind of a report on a project of how many lines of code there are in each kind of programming language, like how much HTML there is, how much CSS, how much is Python. And that also helps you familiarize yourself pretty quickly. Mm. Mm. Other than that, it just looks cool. And so uh, it's probably fun to build. So on that then, how do you feel about like the fact that it looks cool? Is that a good enough reason for you to have it in? Because to be honest, like, although it's even if it was just an aesthetic thing, I feel like sometimes that's okay. Like, it's like, no, this is nice to look. It's nice to have. We, we think it's cool. If we, I don't know, we kind of like it. We feel good about it. Is that a good enough reason, Jared? Or are you like, no, give me facts. <laughs> no, it's good enough for me. I mean, I put it on changelog news. I'm like, this thing's cool. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's just like, surely this person, by the way, uh, written by Jonathan Forsyth. So shout out to Jonathan. Well done. Jonathan. He's probably just, you know, scratches his own itch. He probably thought this doesn't exist. It would be cool. I always do enjoy popping open Daisy Disk or Clean My Mac X or whatever and seeing that layout of my system's hard drive and like where the big files are. Yeah. And so it's like, well, can I take that idea and apply it to Git? It's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely cool. I also do like doing that with Daisy Disk. In fact, I found lots of big audio files, which were when we record these podcasts, we record our own audio locally. Right. So I have lots of audio files of just my side of the conversation. Unfortunately, they also somehow make it into my iTunes. And so sometimes when I'm shuffling music, like I might be, I might be in the bath and I've got music on and then it's playing music and then it comes to one of these tracks. Right. And it's just my side of a conversation. <laughs> and I just have to, I'm you could have a, like a greatest hits album with that. <laughs> yeah. At Ryer's greatest hits. Right. You know, just talks to himself because <laughs> You know, there's this interesting phenomenon now. I don't know if you guys have been out on the streets at all, but when you're out on the streets, you know, people just talk into the air. Oh, yeah. And when they do it now, you can no longer assume that they have some sort of a mental disorder or a problem. Right. Because a lot of times they actually have like, you know, the tiniest little ear pod in. That's right. Or something. Yeah. And they're not just being insane. They're actually just having a conversation on the phone or something. And it's really strange. <laughs> yeah. Th this, this actually is really good for me because I am the person that walks around just saying things out loud. <laughs> um, and, and I don't sometimes think 
like sometimes like if I'm going to have a difficult conversation, I'll sort of like run it over in my head. And sometimes I'll say it out loud. And I've noticed a couple of times people looking and then I just like slowly put my hand up to my ear and just say, okay, thank you. Bye. And <laughs> pretend I was on the phone. <laughs> That's a pro tip right there. Yeah, That is a pro tip. I like what? that. A little speck of brain science for you. Ooh, yeah. okay. It is totally okay to talk to yourself, even out loud. Mm, thanks. In public? Uh, yeah. Any, well, I mean, there's etiquette. So, I mean, pick your right. place. But you are not suffering from sort of any mental condition if you talk to yourself. Now, there's certain circumstances where it goes too far. Mm. But any normal person who speaks out loud to themselves, it's just a way that you sometimes process your thinking. Everybody's different with how they think. And so you may be a person who thinks out loud and has to say it out loud to like really believe it as fact. And so I'm here to tell you it's okay. Huh. And I don't disagree with that, but I'm here to tell you that when you do it in public places <laughs> that you look like you're insane. That's all. Truth. I'm yeah. Truth. Okay. And then you just say goodbye and you put your hip finger up to your ear mm -hmm. and you look totally normal again. So I learned that today. TIL. That is a good pro mm -hmm. tip, man. <laughs> One thing I'm noticing is the time to generate the database. Linux is one of the repositories. C Python was one of the repositories used. And the commits on these repos are tremendous. I mean, yeah. more than a million on Linux, mm. a little over 100,000 on C Python, wow. and the time to generate the Git log, the Git log size. And one of the things that Jonathan mentions is wanted features, which I think is pretty cool. It's like obviously faster database generations in there, uh, sub module tracking, remembering filters, other things. I think this is a. It's one of those things you're like, should this be in Git? Probably not, right? Like you don't want Git to be muddied with like this kind of feature. Right. So this lives in userland. And is this the best one in userland? And if so, like how does this kind of thing get support? Mm. You know, to like not die. Great question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the only one I've ever seen. I'm not saying it's the only one in userland. I think with typical open source, don't you just have to like inspire people to collaborate with you like it has to be interesting or good enough right to get that grassroots support of like yeah sub module tracking would be amazing i tried this my project has sub modules and it completely ignores them but a lot of the stuff is in there so i would love to have that how can i help out i think that i mean that there's really no other way that these kind of projects which really are kind of like scratching an itch little there's no business around this like this is a small scoped thing that can really get support unless you inspire other people to just want more from it and then they help out. Yeah, but the, look at Daisy Disk. I mean, that's, I think, a paid app or it has at least paid features, doesn't it? So you, yeah. if there is a real business use case out of something like this, then yeah, it maybe. does have a potential future. I, but I kind of love that it's play. It's like we play a lot mm -hmm. and then sometimes there's opportunities that come out of that play. And this is the thing a lot of software teams forget about, I think. They... They get very serious and everything's yeah. sort of, you know, and you, you forget that actually, you know, you, you've got to be able to be creative and just try things and do things because you want to, or you just think it's cool. Just thinking something's cool is a great reason. If someone on my, one of my teams comes and says, I've got this idea, I, you know, I don't know where it fits or anything. I just think it's cool. That's really compelling for me, especially because they're so motivated to actually do it. Right. It's harder than the other way around. You going to them and saying, you know what would be cool? And then you telling them. <laughs> and they're like, okay, I'll do it because Matt wants me to. Sure. But less likely. Yeah. That, sure, that's cool, granddad. <laughs> they just think I'm their granddad. Yeah. Right. And I haven't even got any kids. So how can I be their granddad? Do you know what I mean? Think. Inquiring minds want to know, Matt. They do want to know. Yeah. You can't do it, I think. That's a great point, though, the play aspect, because a yeah. lot of things happen when you do play. I mean, obviously, your mind is different. It's in a different mode. You know, like sometimes you're, as you said before, wow, that was actually, I may be outing your your potential unpopular opinion. I won't say it, but, mm. you know, when you make a plan, you know, it can be too rigid. So I'm, I'm dropping some hints He's there. He's totally going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to ruin it. I'm not going to ruin it. Okay. You know, when you play, there's freedom, right? There's no constraints. There's no guardrails necessarily. It's like, where can I go? Where can I explore? What should I do? And then, you know, maybe out of it comes fruits. And maybe that can be a business if you really wanted to be. But, I mean, I think there's examples of, like, large things in our world. Like, Flickr, I think, was a, a game at first. Before it was, like, the photo sharing, right? you know, 1.0 version of Instagram, essentially. And Slack was supposed to be a communication tool while they built a game. <laughs> See? <laughs> the same teams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were just playing. Mm -hmm. Are they ever going to make that game? Probably not. 
It's done. Too busy making very successful companies. Yeah, they've let it go. But they may play The Sims, which is a good transition to simulating. Oh. This has actually sparked my interest because I was like, you know, I love to have permission to mess up and like get Sim as the next one, visually simulate get operations in your own repos. And I think that's pretty cool because you can think of like, what would happen if I branch? What would happen if this happened here? You know, what would happen if I rebase that over here? And it's like, you you can sort of like have this fictitious world, this potential future and just erase it. But isn't that kind of like Git does anyways? But it, this gives it to you visually. That's the difference. Yeah, this visualizes it for you so you can understand what's going to happen. And also it's completely safe. Like it's with Git, you know, that 99% of the time it's in there, right? Like no matter what you do, there are circumstances where you can lose data, but most of the time, even if you thought you've lost something, it's in there because of the way it works. But you have to find out how to get it back. And that's like a huge time sink, right? And can be very anxiety ridden and all that. And dangerous. Like it's like, it's like running in production. But with this, not only does it visualize it for you, which is super cool, but it also never does it. Right. So it's 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 kind of like a dry run in that way. The author of it did describe why it's better than dry runs, but I've lost the blog post. All I have is the repo at this time. So that's- I, I do a lot of R-syncing in my network. And in some cases I do deletion. You do a lot of R sync. Do a lot of R swat. R R syncing. R sync. But is that like ta- tattoos on people's pit- sure, back? Sure, sure, Matt. Sure. <laughs> yeah. R syncing. Nice. Touche. <laughs> is this a hobby or are you trying to get a new gig going? Yeah. None of the above. None of the <laughs> Can above. you do me let's, one? Let's go to the flag I'm going to mention here. Okay. So with when you are sync, it's like, well, it, especially if you're going to delete, you're moving data to or fro from a place. And it's like, well, I can use dash N and just kind of see what it might do. Right. And it will d- go and do that whole thing. You know, it will... And that's my favorite thing, like especially with that kind of like dangerous tool, you need sort of a simulation zone so that you can like simulate. Yeah. So that's this is interesting. Like, could you have this tool, but for real as well? What what like? Well, once you do the tool, then then you then you do it for real. I see. Or you mean you want to visualize it as it goes? Yeah. Is your question, Matt, simulate it like the results and just say, okay, do it? button yeah i guess so is that what you're saying yeah yeah. it's like commit it's like yeah that looks good yeah Uh, looks good do it yeah probably it can so i did find the part where it says you know why aren't dry runs good enough because git does have a dry run feature which is like the rsync one that you described there yeah where it will just tell you what it's going to do and the author of this which we should shout out as well rsyncing matt yeah i can't unhear it now (laughs) <laughs> I know. I do a lot of R sinking. Uh, and then when you plant a flag, I'm picturing, you know, a tattoo artist with, with a flag. R sinking. Yeah. So this tool by Jacob Stopak from the initial commit team, which is a team that does Git things. And he writes that there's a dry run flag in Git, which is dash N also. So maybe that's a, a, a standard or at least an idiom. It enables you to get some idea of how the command will affect the state of the repository. But he says these commands can be useful but not all Git commands have them. So, you know, Git has all these subcommands and they don't all have dry runs. And he says, and the purely text-based output can be quite sparse as is typical of Git's command line interface. Moreover, many people out there are visual learners and could benefit greatly from a visual approach to simulating the impact of a Git command before running it. So imagine this tool, Git Sim, as if it's a dry run that has complete coverage of the subcommands and visualizes it for you. Hmm. Maybe, you know, this one I could argue, put it in the Git. Hmm. Like this is just a better user experience for dry runs, hmm. potentially. Yeah, I, this this would be very useful and probably would like satisfy some of my fears here around, you know, Git commands just being too complicated and I don't really have the confidence that it's going to, that I really know what it's going to do because it's very abstract and can be quite, surprising the effects if you're not really au fait with with git and so this would give a level of confidence for sure it'd be like okay so you've typed this in and now here's a picture is this is this what you meant and you're like no absolutely not you've just saved me a lot of embarrassment thank you or the other way around yeah the dash dash animate is a pretty cool flag too like it animates what's going to happen like a presentation yeah that's pretty cool. It looks good too. They have GIFs uh, on the 
I, I don't know, they might not be GIFs actually, but they have video animations on there. I just don't want to get letters of people saying, that's not a GIF. You doesn't know what a GIF is. At I'm least like, you pronounced it right. Good point. So points for that. Thanks, Gerard. Seems to be a .mp4, just to be clear, Matt. Thank you. We, do, we have to be a bit pedantic because I do, I, oh, we do. I do get letters <laughs> when I say, so, sometimes I'll say something like just Which ones? being silly. Oh, it's lots of them in, in different orders, depending on what they want to write. Okay. Yeah. Daily or would you say you get those daily or weekly? Um, yeah, I would. I would say that. <laughs> yeah, I would. yeah. I wouldn't, oh. I wouldn't say moreover. Someone said moreover earlier. I don't think I've ever said. Well, that. I was reading, I was reading verbatim from a blog post. So you can take that up with Jacob Stopak. Right. I'll let him know. Jason, just come here, Jason. <laughs> Jacob. J- Jacob. Jacob. Sorry, Jacob. Um, all right. So that sentence had a bug in it, which leads us to our next tool. <laughs> Git bug. Oh, Ooh. all these links are brilliant. This is professional. Yeah, you're yeah. really working with pros here today. Yeah, this one I love. The, I absolutely love this concept. All right, so Git Bug, written by Michael Mure, mm-hmm. I think is how you pronounce his name. Good name. Basically, he's put a bug tracker in Git. Mm. It's fully embedded in Git. You only need your Git repo to have a bug tracker. So anywhere your repo goes, the bugs are right there. Oh, hello. works offline. No vendor lock in. It's fast. I'm just reading his bullet points now. It doesn't pollute <laughs> your project. It integrates with your tooling. So that's what's cool about it is as bridges over to GitHub issues, to GitLab, mm. whatever they call their issues, to Jira, if you're in hell already. <laughs> I mean. Oh, boy. Jeez, Jared. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no love loss for Jira. Say it like you feel it, man. Say it like you feel it. Oh, I've, I've never liked that tool. I don't know anybody who does. Mm. I feel sorry for people building it. If you do... Send Matt a letter. Oh, yeah, please. If you love Jira, let Matt know. Send it to Jason. He doesn't exist. I got his name wrong. <laughs> there you go. But this is really cool. I mean, mm. how do you track your bugs, Matt? I just don't write any. That's kind of the way I do it. But how do you do it? Um, in GitHub, it has issues. But actually having okay. it in Git, and I assume there's like, it's a text file or something, or some data file where they store this. And what's quite nice about this, I guess, is with a commit... You can also fix the bug and then that all gets pushed at the same time. And because it's in the actual, it's because it's in Git, it's always correct. If you go back and check out an old branch, you'll see the bugs that exist for that old, well, you know, previous commit. You'll see the bugs that existed at that time. So I think that's really clever. Yeah, it's super cool. The way this is built out, it like models Git's way of working. Uh, so it works like Git works. It's just inside of your Git repo. It has a, a CLI, so you interact with it from your CLI, both adding bugs, reading bugs, etc. And then it also has a little web UI built in that you can launch and just run locally, which kind of gives it a GitHub style issues list with filters and open and closed. And I don't know. I'm think I'm pretty impressed by this tool actually. I think Michael did a really good job with it. What about tracking? In production, though, how does that happen? Like, where does it get the the reports? Oh, error tracking? Yeah, like, is, is a bug in the error? I mean, that's kind of like the same world, isn't it? No. Bug tracker, error tracker. How do you do it, Matt, over there in Grafana? Well, I was going to say, like, if there's an error or a bug or whatever, you just open it and, I guess, commit it, right? It exists at that point in the code base. So, Well, think about our error tracker, Adam, in Sentry. Right. There's a ton of errors in there. And some of them turn into bugs that we open on GitHub issues. But if if every error turned into a bug, then we'd have my my no bugs command would be way off. Like there's so many errors that only and thousands of errors can represent the same code deficiency mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, depending on scale. Well, one important thing that you do though with that is like you track commits to deploys to errors and I guess to bugs. And I think I'm just wondering if you had that full circle there, that, that comprehensive look. Because it seems it could be one-sided unless it gets that sort of like other source of truth, right? Uh, I'm not following. Say it again in different words. Hmm. Make it mean a different thing as well if you can. <laughs> <laughs> At Grafana, we, do, we have error budgets, actually. So this is a concept that okay. if anyone's not familiar with it, you really should be because it's so good. Okay, It's basically like we're allowed to have a certain amount of errors. And I've worked at a place before where we had a sort of non-technical, that's the politest way I could say it, as a non-technical CTO. Okay. Um, it's an idiot. That's simply. <laughs> and he said, no, there shouldn't be any errors. 
Like, why are there errors? Why are there bugs? You shouldn't have any bugs and no errors, right? Genuinely, that was his position. And neither of either. Okay. Yeah. And like, okay, sure. Uh, it's almost like you don't really know what you're talking about, frankly, if that's your position. And so in the real world, errors happen all the time and you're allowed a certain level, a certain budget that you can spend. And that means you can be creative and flexible and do things and make mistakes. So you have the flexibility to within, within the SLOs. Thresholds. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You're allowed to take some risks. Because if you if you're too if you really don't want anything to ever break ever, you have to do a lot more work, and you can be a m- lot more right. free if you're allowed f- for there to be some errors. As long as you jump on it and fix them when they happen. Mm-hmm. How are those measured? Is it like errors per lines, or is it errors per week, or how does that play out? Yeah, it'll be like failed re- like HTTP requests, depending on what it is. So if it's like a certain number of those could fail before I see. Yeah, before you you consider you've got a problem. Um, a threshold yeah. sure that is a cool idea i think the same applies for incidents and it's just realistic yeah. too right like it just all accounts for reality and it lets you move forward while still maintaining and not letting it get out of hand which is what you're trying to really fight against is like all of a sudden are you saying g-i-t <laughs> get out of hand or g-e-t <laughs> get out of hand that's open to interpretation okay. well that's the thing not in my accent it's not because they're very different when i pronounce those two words and i think oh, i okay. think it's i think the g-i-t the the that project is a play on words in a U.S. accent. I think it's it's like get, but it's like, isn't it? No, no, is it not? <laughs> no, no, it's get. It's what get. do you mean? No, it's because because Linus wanted to make the joke on the term that it's a tool for gets. Like, isn't get kind of a pejorative? Yeah, over there. Is that what it was? Yeah, he pretty much said that that it was supposed to be. I should pull up the quote. Oh, I thought it was like a. In a Texan accent, it was just like someone saying get. You want to hear something funny? What, what your accent? I'm a transplant Texan. I know. Okay. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't born here. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I knew a guy. Okay. I still know the guy, <laughs> but I knew a guy. He was describing the parade going through downtown. Mm. And he was telling me that it was going Dan Tan. Mm. <laughs> okay. Cool. Dan Tan. And I'm serious with you. Okay. This is when I first moved here. So I had an excuse. And I was like, what are you talking about? What is Dan Tan? He's like, Dan, he kept saying it. He got louder. <laughs> Dan Tan, yeah. Dan Tan. I'm like, <laughs> can you please explain in different words? And he finally says, downtown. Oh, just, <laughs> like, 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 oh so you can say finally it. Finally, you can say downtown. <laughs> oh. Seriously, man, like Dan Tan for like three minutes here. And I'm asking you, what are you talking about? Well, that's amazing. Okay, I have the final word here. And this is hilarious because it shows how small of a, wor- a world it is. I Googled it. Uh, technically, duck, duck, goat it, if that's a thing. You duck, duck, went. I went there. And I found how Git got its name. And this article, this historical article, is written by none other than Jacob Stopak. What? From Initial Commit. Yes, he wrote this. J- Jason, he's back. He's done all this history here. And he says, okay, when, Lin- when Linus Torvalds made his initial commit of Git, April 7th, 2005, he supplied this message. Initial revision of quote, get the information manager from hell. That's the subject. And then he provides the, the, the deeper cut in the, uh, the content. Yeah. What do you call it? The body, the body of the commit message. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. It says, get the stupid content tracker. Get can mean anything depending on your mood. Uh, one random three letter combination that is pronounceable and not actually used by any common Unix command. The fact that it is a mispronunciation of get may or may not be relevant. Hello. It, uh, it may not be relevant, Matt. But it may be. Uh, two, stupid, contemptible, and despicable. Simple. Take your pick from the dictionary of slang. Three, global information tracker. So it could be an acronym. You're in a good mood, and it actually works for you. Angels sing, and a light suddenly fills the room. And the fourth one. Oh, I can't actually say the fourth one. We'll have to bleep it out like crazy. Beep. You have to look that one up, oh. friends. Oh. Uh, he <laughs> says, this is a stupid but extremely fast directory content manager. It doesn't do a whole lot, but what it does do is track directory contents efficiently. So there you have it from the horse's mouth. The slang get may or may not be relevant. Wow. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you. So thanks for that, Jason. <sighs> I wonder what Dan Tan would think of that. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Tan. Hey, Dan, be cool. have you seen this? You're going to love it. <laughs> you know, for example. 
That's pretty good. I don't want to insult anyone. My other friend, um, I, I'll give you one more. Other friend, I like you just admit you've only got two. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> my other yeah. friend. My other friend. <laughs> yeah. Wow. He also had an experience on his first entry upon Texas. He came from Montana. Okay. Now Montana's, you know, Montana, as you may know. Now he, he, he drove into town and there was somebody power washing something at the gas station. And when he drove over the power wash, do you know what a power washer is, everybody? I do, I think. Just confirming. I feel like I do, yeah. Right? Power washer. He's power washing, you know, whatever it might be. And there's a lot of pressure in that line. And, and this person drives over the power washer's hose. And the guy yells at him. He says, that's 5,000 PSI there, man. It'll blow up. <laughs> Dan Tan said this? Yeah, That's 5,000 PSI in there, man. It'll blow up. That's what he said. <laughs> like as if you drove over this pressure washer's hose because it had such pressure, it would blow up. Well, that's a public service announcement if you ask me. <laughs> Just so you know. Mm. Now, it did not blow no. up. Mm. To this day, we laugh at that. Yeah. What, why, why is that? I don't get this. So the power, you can well, cut this bit out, but I just want to know just for my own sanity. <laughs> I'm going to tell yeah. you why. Because that was the first experience. It wasn't like, hey, welcome to Texas. Uh, <laughs> That's 5,000 PSI. It'll blow up. <laughs> okay. Uh, it wasn't, right. hello, welcome. Good to see you. Get your gas here. Come get some snacks inside or whatever. It was, That's 5,000 PSI. It'll blow up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm over here wondering how many times we can get Adam to say that. Two more times. Two more times. Yeah. I will say it on command in the future, too. Amazing. Just say, do the bit. And I'll just do it. Well, speaking of blowing up, this Git UI project sure is blowing up on the scene. Ooh. What is Git UI? Git UI is a blazing fast terminal UI mm. for Git, and it's written in Rust, which brings me to a subtopic that I want to ask you about, Matt, soon, but let's talk about Git UI first. Written by guys who, whose handle is Extra Worst. So he's not just the worst, he's the Extra Worst. But maybe the sausage kind? I don't know. It's, yes, it's it looks versty, doesn't it? It's, it's versed. Extra versed. versed. You know, it's like it's normal versed, yeah, but this is a bit extra versed, so don't worry about it. <laughs> By the way, I do that German accent to Germans, and they go, what's that? It doesn't sound like... It, just, it doesn't sound German It's just them. good? No. Oh, no, it's so bad that they don't even yeah. know. Whereas everyone else is like, oh, that's a good German accent. <laughs> so I just think it's not. I was about to give it a compliment, yeah, because yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. All right, so here's... Uh, Extraverse's description or why he made this tool. You got to do it right, Jared. Extraverse. <laughs> Matt, you want to read this in the German accent for us? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, it's in the doc there. Yeah. The I do, I do most of my Git work. That I one. do most of my Git work in a terminal, but I frequently find myself using Git GUIs for some use cases like index, commit, diff, stash, blame, and log. Unfortunately, popular Git GUIs all fail with giant repositories or become unresponsive. I've lost the accent. Become unresponsive. Yeah. It went a bit French. It did. <laughs> it also sounds like the way you do it, it sounds very condescending as well, as if the person's like a complete <laughs> idiot who's saying it. Like you're definitely making fun. So we should uh, we should leave that in, but we should back that out and say, we, this is totally cool, extra verse. We don't think that you're the way Matt's portraying you right now, in fact. No, I'm just doing my German accent. <laughs> That's right. Uh, extra first. Well, you know, we have a, we have like a, there's a stereotype that German people don't have a good sense of humor. And it it's one of those that I don't know where it comes from because every single person I've met from Germany has like a, an extra first kind of sense of humor. Like it's <clears throat> uber good. I love it. So hopefully our friends in Germany will appreciate that. But to read it in, in terms that we can all understand here, he's, he does say that a lot of the Git GUIs fail on giant repos and become unresponsive and usable. So he built this. It's in the terminal. Would you use it is the question. It's written in Rust. I know, Matt, it's not written in Go. <laughs> but would you use it anyways? Because a lot of us say, hey, I like to keep it simple. I like to stay in my terminal. I'm in the same way. I'm going to shout out one Git GUI here near the end. But mostly I just use the Git command line like you do, Matt. But what if you had more at the command line? You don't have to leave your terminal and it's not going to choke on, you know, the Linux repo, for example. Would you use this? Because it looks pretty sweet. Well, I, I feel like I need to come out now and tell you that I actually use GitHub Desktop 
Um, <laughs> Why do you say that you didn't use the terminal? No, no, no. I said that I have, yeah, because it's uh, because it's like really complicated. I, like, I avoid complicated well, stuff. Yeah. This I like because I must have misheard you. It remind yeah. You, we can go back and check the recording, mate. If you're calling me a liar, yeah, do that little rewind sound. <laughs> I, I, I used to. I'm just being a. Hello, now yeah, I'm back go. to doing this accent again. So <laughs> no, 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 go back further. Go back further. Okay. <laughs> but what I like about this is it reminds me of early computer interfaces, like really early MS DOS type. I used to do QBasic uh, when I was a kid yeah. and stuff. And so it has this real retro feel, which I really like. But kudos to uh, writing in Rust because I feel like for for the times when you really need performance like this in this sort of case yeah i think rust rust is a great choice okay so you're not offended by that no no This episode is brought to you by our friends at Postman. Postman is an API platform for building and using APIs. They are most known for API testing and you may already use them, but they've built a full featured API platform to help developers along each step of the API lifecycle. But what does it mean for Postman to be an API platform? Well, from API design, testing, monitoring, documentation, mocking, to the sharing and discoverability of APIs, they've built a full suite of tools to help teams build APIs together faster. Over 20 million developers use Postman to deliver their APIs, plus they have a generous free tier, start designing, developing, and testing APIs, organize all your API development into workspaces, and share those workspaces with other developers. You can create public workspaces to collaborate with the world's developers. You can back up your work to Postman's cloud. You get their core tooling and collaboration for up to three users. Sign up and start using Postman for free today at postman.com slash changelogpod. Or for our listeners already using Postman, we encourage you to explore the entire API platform that Postman has to offer. Again, postman.com slash changelogpod. So the subtopic then, so language support or languages these tools are written in and therefore distributed in. We have uh, two in Python. That was the heat map and the git sim. Uh, this git bug is written in Go. Git UI written in Rust. The next one we're going to talk about if we get to it, git branch list also written in Rust. And that got me thinking. I still can't tell if you're saying get to it or get to it. <laughs> I'm, I mean, just you're really getting me here. If we do it downtown. <laughs> Did you see that, Matt? You like that one, didn't you? You're really getting you're me. You're really getting to me. I'm sorry. I had to punt it out there. Fair enough. Install, I think, is all that matters, right? I mean, in the end. Well, that's the question. I, for me, it is. Um, for Matt, I wonder if you're feeling like maybe Rust is starting to eat Go's lunch for like command line tools. Well, I mean, first of all, I think like, yeah, it's about what's the easiest thing to run. And if it's Python and I've got some weird balked Python thing and I have to fix it or something, then that's a big barrier for me. But if, if, yeah. if Python's your bread and butter, then... I feel like that's okay. I just, I don't use it enough that I have any confidence in it. So I do like that you get single binary. Yeah, the Python one gives me pause as well. Just because I don't know if it's going to go right. Yeah, can you mention, uh, you do the talking, Jared. Can you can you mention pip install, your, your feelings about it? Yeah, if it's pip install for me, I just have anxiety. Mm. Even though it works most of the time, it's the same way. And hey, old school Rubyist, but if if I see your tool and I see it's written in Ruby, I'm kind of like, eh, do I want to mess with this? And that's how I am with Python as well. Their stories are just fraught. Do you not use GitHub then? That's Ruby, isn't it? Well, I don't mind the website. I'm talking about a tool that I'm going to install with dependencies locally. As a dev tool. Yeah, I got no problem with Ruby-based things, but if you say gem install this tool... Mm. I'm like, you know what? I don't really trust my Ruby environment over the course of years on my Mac. And I'm the same way with Python. Whereas with Go and with Rust, it seems, and JavaScript's had the same bad story for me, but Dino is actually showing, you know, and with TypeScript is showing some new opportunities to have universal binaries, which is cool. I'm just way more likely to say, if you can just grab a binary, drop it in your path and execute it, 
I'm like, I will do that a mm-hmm. hundred times a day. But if your tool says pip install or it says gem install or it says NPM install, I'm kind of like, uh, do I want to mess with this? That's just my sense. Does that resonate with you guys? Especially if you're on Linux proper. Like if you're on Mac, it's different. Cause like you kind of have to use homebrew or pip if that's the way you want to go, or maybe vanilla straight up Ruby or a binary. But if it's on Linux, it should be an apt or whatever your sure. might be yum or pick your, it should be a package, you know, or you should have to update your registry with whatever package directory you want to use and, you know, apt update and get that and install. That's my feelings. I don't like to pip install anything if I don't have to. Yeah. When I get a new uh, computer, which happens more than I can justify, I don't like it when I'm uh, the first time I'm forced to just add all these tools to be able to install stuff. Like I feel like it's a nice clean machine and then, and then I'm, and I hold off and I hold You're off. You're muddying it. Yeah. At least if it's a go binary, I can delete the file and it's gone. And I know where it is. When I install, I don't know what happens when I NPM install something. Sometimes I'll do that in the wrong folder and then I get a node modules folder on my desktop, which is synced through iCloud. So it uses, you know what I mean? Like it could be a can of worms. Right. So I, I am, yeah, into that simplicity thing. But if I'm using, yeah. if I'm already using that tool chain, if it's a tool for, say, people who are writing Node, uh, then it completely makes sense that it would be written. If it's a right, yeah, if it's a data tool that's going to be used mostly in Python, then I think you you also can get away with it. Although you still have the version issues, but yeah, you you can't. I mean, just a single binary, I love it. General purpose tooling that wants to be used by people that are outside your particular ecosystem, ideally, which should be packaged in a way that we can just you know, isolate it, install it, drop it in our path and execute it. And delete it, uninstall it. And delete it without worrying about it, just like spreading files all throughout your disk. I remember on Windows, I used to sometimes, like you'd install something and then you're like, oh, I want to uninstall that. And there's no way to, obvious way to do it. So you Google it or you duck, duck, go it. Right. And it's like, okay. You went there. You have to, uh, you have to remove these files, then go and find these files and remove them. Then open the registry if you want to remove these values Gosh. from the registry, you know, like. Yeah, and it scatters, it changes throughout your registry. And you're like, ah, I have one global registry and I don't know all the places that it's been changed. Yeah, yeah it was, you actually had to do occasional just reformat your computer to clean it all. Mm-hmm. And that, that used to bother me. And I like on a Mac yeah. that you, uh, applications are mostly contained inside that single mostly, zip, mostly, but not entirely though, right? No, not entirely, yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking with the M1, there's there's more change. I didn't homebrew move to the opt directory, I believe, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Yep. Homebrew is in, installs into opt now versus user local. Mm. And I can't recall why that was, but that was a new change in order to. I'm sure some sort of, you know, security enclave reasoning, right? Maybe. It's just challenging. Yeah. I mean, you think, I mean, you got P lists that spread about. You've got something that might be in my application support folder or just, you know, it's, it's, uh, Give me a good self-contained uninstaller with the thing. Give me an eject button, whether it's an application that I, you know, installs a literal Mac app right. or, you know, a dev tool. Give me an uninstall flow that is, respects my system. Because, like, I'm sure you, developer, developing it, care about your, your system. Keep it pristine. And with reluctance, install new things when it's a new machine, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the the only upside of the, that style is that you do have preferences that persist if you uninstall and then reinstall or upgrade. Yeah, but you, you don't always want that, do you? Yeah, exactly. But sometimes you're like, oh, actually, oh, I don't have to redo this. That's nice. It, it has pleasantly surprised me once or twice, but most of the time I don't want it. I want it to be completely gone. Yeah, sometimes I'll uninstall something because I can't figure out how to change a setting back. And then I uninstall it and then it reinstall it and it's just remembered the settings it's right yeah. there yeah it's right there for you it's waiting for you and i have to uh, i'm like where's the registry is there a registry and that's what i'm on a mac so there isn't another culprit is installing something to dot local in your root directory or your home yeah your home i guess and not removing it or putting it in like a hidden folder i mean obviously i'm gonna do a LL or L, depending upon what your flavor of how Welsh you are, LS you use. I mean, if you got a if you got an alias or whatnot, you know, which I do because I use oh my zsh. He doesn't have time to type L twice. <laughs> yeah, I don't like <laughs> just one. Just yeah. one. L. Nobody has time for that. No, no, you're busy man. Why two when you can just do one? It's a good question. All right, so quickly, Matt, uh, respond to my second question, which was as a gopher, as a representative of the Go community, 
do you feel like Rust is encroaching on your previously standalone domain of like these command line installable tools? Like there's a lot of new tooling, whereas Go was like the thing for a little while where it's like, and it's written in Rust. Mm -hmm. Does that, does that, are you feeling intimidated or no. encroached upon? No, no. I remember when Go was like becoming that. And I would always say at the time, like, you know, write it, write it in whatever you want, right? It's like whatever's the right tool for the job. So that's that attitude. Can't really like, don't really deviate from that. I think, I think Go, I don't think Rust will just d defeat Go because it's really hard to learn. And that's the trade-off you make. It's like much harder to learn, much harder to write Rust. But the trade-off is you get much more secure, much safer execution. And I guess if it compiles, you've got a high chance it's going to be correct. And so there's like benefits there. But I think, yeah, I think goes, you know, it's, I, I don't know if it's just like, we'll see how the trends happen. It's definitely will, there'll be trendy sort of things going around, but I don't know. I think they'll coexist basically forever, these two. Fair enough. I was hoping for a less reasonable and nuanced position, but you know, I can only so okay. reasonable. expect so much. Okay. Well, in that case, I could get my guitar and do an anti-rust song if you like. Okay. I do. Oh, we're in for a treat here. Matt has left his chair. His his Mac display is tracking him throughout the room. He's yeah, back. The, the Mac, he has a guitar. The Mac display is annoying because it follows you around when you move and you sometimes... Yeah. It's, talk about surveillance capitalism, yeah. huh? I try and sometimes move out of frame to pick my nose, and then the blooming camera follows me, and because everybody sees it. What's this song called? Anti Rust song or what? Yeah, I don't know. I guess. Um, yeah, I guess that's going to be an anti Rust. What key do you want? Let's to? call it Rust Away. Rust Away. Rust Away. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I should just do it. We can always cut this, can't we? No. <laughs> it has to go in. you're typing in I never seen such crazy things what the heck is all this gonna do I got some very bad news for you we're gonna rust away Today. Rust away, Matt Raya. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah, that's really uh, Can I critique? Yeah. Can I critique? No, you're gonna hurt his feelings. No, do it because uh, it wasn't great. It won't hurt your feelings. So, if it was, if there was a version two, let's say you go away and you think about sleeping, and maybe you sleep a little bit and you dream. And you think, well, th this is actually a hit song. I could probably do something with this. I would just encourage you to put a little bit more Rust Lang specifics into it. Yeah, I don't know enough to do that. I was thinking that. Uh, I was going to mainly focus on like... You could have mentioned Cargo or anything. I mean, really anything. Yeah, but my knowledge is really limited. I was going to focus on <laughs> like... Um, it's really, it was really quite awful, actually. Yeah, I was going to focus on uh, <laughs> like vulcanizing things and actually like, you know, to, to prevent Rust. Like to actually, like they use painting and stuff to ah, protect protect right. the, the metals so they don't rust. Anodized, yeah. Rusting metal, why would you want that? It's red iron oxide. There's lots of ideas, but um, sure. yeah, it just didn't happen. I'm sure if Dan Tan had done it, he would have done a much better <laughs> job because I know he's, he's particularly good at songs. Dan Tan. Uh, so one quick hat nod to uh, the Git UI project is that it seems to be easily installable regardless of originating language, which is super awesome. Great song, Matt. Thank you for sharing that with us. It was awesome. I was going to hop in and start singing uh, with you, but I'm, my skills are a bit rusty. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Let's move on. Git Branchless. This is our last one of the list here. Uh, high velocity monorepo scale workflow for Git. This is like a grab bag of utilities. It's a weird name, Git Branchless, because it doesn't have to do anything to do with branching, really. But it adds a bunch of cool stuff, like Git Undo, like a very nice... It's a good name then, isn't it, Jared? Like there's no branching? Yeah, it's branchless. 
And you're like, I don't know why less. it's called that. It doesn't have anything to do with branches. But that's it's called branch less. That's not an impression of you. Yeah, but why would you name yourself based on what you have nothing to do with? Like, I just feel like it's not the way to do it. Yeah. Maybe you because know? they're against it. And so they didn't. I, I don't call myself Jared Rustless, you know, because I don't write any rust. Good name, though. <laughs> nice name. I like that. <laughs> Sounds like okay. a cool guy. I'll, I'll, I'll consider it. They call me Jared Rustless Santo. <laughs> <laughs> that is a cool name. <laughs> Okay. That is pretty cool. I might pick that up, actually. All right, I revoke my argument. <laughs> Point is, there's lots of cool stuff here. Smart log. Get undo, get restack, get sync, get move. Lots of good stuff. Written in Rust. So <laughs> it's not Rustless. <laughs> by Walid Khan. And been out there for a while. But uh, not too much to say about this on the show for me, necessarily, except for that. It's just a lot of like very nice user experience improvements in your command line Git. So if you're not like Matt using GitHub Desktop and you're a real dev using the command line, then maybe check out Git Branchless. Yeah. In terms of naming, you know, same song, different singer. Since we're talking about Rust Away and Matt's doing some jingles for us. I was thinking Git Utilities. I mean, this is it's a bunch of utilities. Why not like make a standard utility utility library? Mm, right. So I googled it, and there is a Git Utils, but it, it's not maintained. Well, no wonder he didn't name it that. Mm. It's taken. It's not maintained. Ah. You know, and it's it's sort of like I would I don't want to call it dead, but it's I mean, the last commit was two years ago. It's probably either perfect software or unmaintained. Mm. Right. It's tough to tell the difference sometimes. I was just talking about this recently. I think on Changelog News on a post about quitting. What's the difference between quitting and being finished? You know, they're quite a bit different, but with open source, you can't tell like, is this thing unmaintained or is it actually finished? Some things are just yeah. done. Other things are abandoned and you got to find out which is which. Yeah, this is, uh, this is always the problem that I have um, uh, because people, one of the ways they decide if a project is worth uh, using is the look, when was the last release or like, you know, and, and it's almost oh, like we're almost to the point where we're gonna, just going to do releases regularly for the sake of it, even if nothing changes. Mm -hmm. And it sort of encourages bloat, encourages feature bloat as well. Like when a tool kind of nails it, then it doesn't, you don't need to keep going on that. But uh, similarly, like software's never finished. And uh, so it's not so simple, but yeah, tough one. We almost need like a health meter or something like that, like built into GitHub. Or externally, like Socket, like they do a lot of security stuff externally from the repository, regardless of right. its origin, whether it's GitLab, GitHub, or whatever. We almost need like a health meter, or at least a democratized version of it that's like, okay, this may have had a commit two years ago, but it's still, it's being used. Like the downloads are still way up, for example, or the, you know, this release is getting pulled constantly into like other things. You know, there has to be a different metric than just simply... Last commit. GitHub does have that pulse page, which they've kind of they've kind of hidden that, but the pulse, which is kind of that, but it's kind of like what's been going on on this project recently. And you can at least go there and see, well, there's been 17 new issues and no response. Like to me, that's probably abandoned because it's it's generating issues for people, but not even being responded to. Um, generally, finished software is at least. I mean, there's still going to be things that come up over time, but kind of less bugs per response. And then there's like, you know, PR has merged recently and it'll just show you like what's been going on. It's not exactly health though. It's more like recent activity, which can be a proxy for health, but not always. Well, I have good news for you, Jared. What's that? Done or perfect.com is available. So, I mean, we can encourage somebody to build a tool called done or perfect. <laughs> so you got to pick which one it is. Not Dunder Mifflin. Yeah. Done or perfect. Done or perfect. <laughs> so I don't understand. I guess you, you're going to mark your project as done or perfect. Wow. Well, I just was, you know, on the whim here. You know, I'm trying to create a, <laughs> you know, Rust Away song for you, man. Come on, give me a dime. <laughs> no, just some sort of, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't think that the insights tab is that insightful in this regard. So maybe there's something that could be done. Maybe it's just a, maybe it's a fun project. Like Matt said, like, this is just a fun thing. And then maybe GitHub acquires you. And then next thing you know, you're a millionaire or a billionaire. Or you got some stock options in the juggernaut that's called Microsoft that's just like <sighs> slaying it out there. You know? All right. <laughs> I don't know. That, that escalated quickly. One could dream, right? Yeah. So if you register donorperfect.com, you're going to be a billionaire with Microsoft stocks. 
If you do it, yeah, if you execute well, yeah. Yeah, probably. If you if you if you do it, just do it. All right. Well, should we hop to unpopular opinions or should we we have uh we have more things that we've shared that are git related, but we can also yeah. just uh get on with it. Maybe a state of git internally here. Okay. You know, like how do you get Jared? Okay. How do you get Matt and how do Adam, how do you get speaking myself? Okay. Are you a simplicity person, Jared? I know that you just use terminal.app, not iTerm or e- even fig or, you know, what else have we had on the show? I that- do use ZSH now Ooh. versus bash. By force. I use it as if it's bash. I can't believe you were having to go at me for using GitHub desktop and you just use the basic, the first, the only thing that's already installed when you get your first computer. You mean a terminal? Yeah. Like real developers do? Uh, I don't subscribe to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't actually either, but <sighs> He's I do funny. use it and I do use it almost exclusively. So now I like a Git GUI myself so I can get graphical. And the one that I prefer is called Git X. Mm. And Git X has been a long, long time project that's gone through multiple forks and abandonments and community pickups as Mac OS has changed dramatically over the years. And so there was this Rowan, I think it was Rowan J had a fork of Git X that they maintained for a while after the original Git X author didn't want to do it anymore. And then that went unmaintained. And I went searching actually for a GUI specifically for a few things. I like to do staging and committing, uh, especially like, what do you call it? Chunk commits, like specific lines of a file and like selecting all that. I like to do that in a GUI and not from the command line because it's just clunky from the command line. That's the main thing I do inside of a GUI. And so Git X was gone for a while. It was just like abandoned. I was super sad. I started looking for a new one. And then it got revitalized in the last year or two by the community. This is like the best side of open source, right? Like people that loved it and wanted to use it, picked it back up. And now it's under like the Git X GitHub org even. It's not some user's account. And it's an open source Git GUI for Mac OS that's under active development once again. Mm. Mostly maintenance mode, but I'm happy in maintenance mode because perfect. it's a good GUI. And we're, you know, I don't need any new features, honestly. It does what I like, and I like what it does. And so that's what I use. I use the command line for most things, git log, git status, uh, simple commits, like git commit dash all with a message, command line, push and pulls, command line, but staging, reviewing, that kind of thing from git x. So I would highly recommend that for Mac OS users. Mm-hmm. Let's give a little shout out since you mentioned the fact that this is being maintained. Thank you to, this is not sponsored, but I am a fan, Mac Stadium. In the footer of the readme, it says, oh, that's the license, never mind. The one before the last, not the very, very (laughs) end of the readme, almost to the end of the readme. It says this project is supported by Mac Stadium Open Source Developer Program, and they give them a free Mac Mini for their CI. So they say thank you to Mac Stadium. So, I mean, that's super cool, like, I think we should do like shout outs, Jared, to like those that are supporting open source in some way, shape or form, just like giving services away to enable just no new features, but just stability, right? Just keeping the thing alive. Well, shout out to me then. I donated a M1 MacBook to the Wales project, uh, which is Wales app. You know, you can build desktop apps using JavaScript and they're great. They feel like native apps. And I wanted to support that project. I don't talk enough about what a sort of open source hero I am, frankly. Uh, so, <laughs> really. Well, that's what we have here, Matt. Could you sing yourself a song about yeah. yourself, maybe? Matt is nah. a hero in the open source world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Pretty the good. course. Well, I did I did write Testify, which is Go's big, that's the testing framework that everyone uses in Go. Well, we had you on the show talking about your stuff. You had Bitbar, your Xbar, right? So, you got your open source uh, bona fides. Yeah, but I'm just, because I'm so modest, I'm probably the mod- most modest person in the world. You seem very modest. Yeah. yeah. And it's a big weakness because... Uh, like, What's your greatest weakness, actually? I, I don't know. I'm, I, it, it's, it's a dis- I do myself a disservice. So this M1 MacBook Pro, it's being used by someone to maintain whales, I assume? Or are they, are they sharing it and mailing it around? 
I, I love the idea of that. But no, they someone has it and they use it to... Like a CI? No, no, they're using it to actually test because it's, it's de- you're building desktop apps. And so M1 was very, M1 was very different and they wanted to, yeah, there was work to do there. Uh, That's true. That's a great point too. I mean, when you, when you do desk or platform specific development and you don't have the latest rev of Apple Silicon, you know, you need that and maybe you don't have the cash to shell out or want to, cause this is just a fun thing to you. Right. You need supporters. That's cool. Yeah. And of course you can sponsor a lot of projects now on GitHub. Um, mm. So I recommend that. And I don't think enough companies do that. If you're using, if, if you're a company and you use some open source project and you can sponsor it, I feel like, you just should like that. We should, we should make that more normal. Yeah. Really. You know, especially if you make money off that project in directly or indirectly. For sure. Well, again, max shout out to them. Super cool. Super cool. So you're a pretty simplistic Git user then Jared. I mean, you, you mainly stay command line only except for visual specifics. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it simple. You know, you're a simplistic Git. That's what he just said to you. I love that. <laughs> And I owned it. I do. I I agree. Clip it. Well, I pause. Simplistic Git user. Yeah, you did pause. And that's where we'll do the cut. Yeah, I had to do that. Yep. Just remember that, you know, I had to describe to you guys what Git meant earlier in this show. So I'm not sure which one of us is simplistic. But (laughs) that's just because you DDU better than we do. Yeah. Or DDG. Sorry, DDG. <laughs> I was gonna say what? I thought you'd at least go DDW. I duck duck went faster than you guys could. <laughs> All right, Matt, your turn. How do you get? How do you get? I like to keep it simple. I'm a simple git. Yeah, I like to. If if there's if it's complicated, if it's like oh there's a conflict in this file, I'm like forget it. I'm out. <laughs> I just put in my letter of resignation. Uh, no. Yeah, I, I tend to use GitHub Desktop as much as I can. And then I'll go into the command line if I have to, if things aren't, things aren't working for me. I'm not one of these, like some people like Jared's a couple of times hinted at being like, <laughs> like I'm not a proper dev cause I use desktop apps and stuff. Right. I know Jared, you're joking, but uh, I still have a song for you. I'm also serious. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, you have a song for me. Uh Oh, look what I did. Gosh. Look what I did. Two songs in one show. Is this possible? Don't say that because the f- hopefully the first one gets cut. <laughs> no, fucking cut. Okay. What's the title of this song? Keyboard Wizard. Keyboard Wizard. Okay, good. Oh. I feel like Howard Stern. You know, Howard Stern. Um, pause one second. Howard Stern does a great job of having awesome artists on his show to do like renditions of their song and right. live versions. I feel like Howard Stern right now. Like, what's your song title? Okay, go ahead. Go. Go ahead. Go. All we need is an awesome artist and then we will be him. Well, meanwhile, you've got me. I don't care what you wear Don't care if you swear It doesn't mean that much to me You can do what you need Do as you please You'll hear no argument from me Except what's your ID Your ID, please I wanna know so I can see are you a VS Coder like me, or are you one of those keyboard wizards that you see? Oh, speaking of which, I'm a keyboard wizard, I don't need no mouse. Get that trackpad away from me. I know combinations that'll rock your foundations. I dare you, screen share with me. Screen share with me, screen share with me, I want to know so I can see, are you a keyboard wizard, I don't need no mouse, a trackpad is just a rectangle as far as I'm concerned, cause I'm a keyboard That one's a keeper. Yeah, that's a keeper. That one I actually did write. That's a good one. Thank you. But also, very serious point there, which is, uh, you know, let people just use whatever tools they want. Don't make us feel bad because we can't get out of Vim just because we can't quit Vim. Well, that leads me to a serious question, though. You're As a VS Code user, have you done any of the VS... Because VS Code has a bunch of Git stuff built into it. Do you Have you tried any of that stuff? Do you like it? Are you just like, I'm happy with GitHub Desktop, don't care? 
Actually, yeah, for for the simple like just uh, like stashing, committing changes, like that, I'll just use that in the ID because it's right there exactly. So it's and then if it's a little bit more complicated, I'll open GitHub Desktop and then if I can't do that, I'll phone up one of my smart friends mm-hmm. like Jared and ask him what do I type in to make this fix, please. Debatable. Yeah. <laughs> Hostinger Tutorials mentions that GitHub Desktop specifically says if your remote repository is on GitHub, they say, quote, this tool will be the most useful for you. So, I mean, that's a large tribe, right? I mean, a lot of people have software there. But I do agree that at some point you graduate. It's like, well, certain things can be done via the command line. I'm here. Why eject and go somewhere else? Certain things should be done if you're in VS Code. Why not use some of the visual aids Inside VS Code, I do that. Like, you know, I might add a file to a, you know, to a, a commit that I'm staging up and whatnot and type the message in and along I go. Why go to a full-on GitHub desktop experience? Well, maybe you're visualizing or you're doing something with issues or maybe there's a PR going on and it's a bit more complicated and a, a bit more GitHub specific. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah, it does. Use whatever tools you like. Use whatever tools. So for me... Thank you for asking. Uh, Adam, what's your favorite ever song? <laughs> so, yeah. Favorite yeah, ever song. To pick. Okay. Well, I'm going to go to your side of the pond. I might say something from the Beatles. I'd probably pick from Yesterday. I might, uh, yeah, I'm just actually, I'm a big fan of the, the movie Yesterday. Have you ever seen this movie? Have you seen the movie? Yeah. What a great premise. Amazing. Amazing movie. But it's a great song too. So I'm a Beatles fan. The premise of Yesterday is... This guy it just discovers that the Beatles never existed, and so no one knows them. And but he knows all the mm-hmm. songs, and he's like a songwriter. So he just pretends he writes the Beatles songs. That's right. And then they're all hits, and he becomes a super famous chap. Yeah, I love that. I also love the Beatles very much. I have an original Sgt. Pepper's album in mono, which is which is good. I, I just listen to it in one ear because you, you might as well. And yeah, I, I just. Beautiful. Paul McCartney, I think, probably one of our greatest ever songwriters. You know, just amazing. Phenomenal. Phenomenal artist. So that's, so yeah, my answer is that. I mean, I think uh, The Beatles is is on my list of top artists, top songs. Like, if I had to pick a song on replay forever, mm-hmm. I would say don't. But if I had to, if it was by force, absolute force. What's this? Hang on. What's this? What's the situation? How, what? I don't know. I don't want to speculate, but it's, it's probably terrible. Gun to your head or? They've got your kids. Oh, the phone calls come from inside the house. <laughs> come on now. You want to do a Liam Neeson situation here? You want to go You want to go there, Matt? Oh, Matt loves Liam Neeson. He does a Liam Neeson. I don't Neeson. care who you are. <laughs> Gosh. I want you to listen to the same song on repeat forever. Or I will find you. <laughs> Yesterday. Yesterday. No mercy. Oh, Gosh. Uh, that yes. you, you played into that brilliantly. Matt, I knew you had a, a Liam Neeson up your sleeve, and so you were just waiting for an opportunity there. I figured he could do that. Yeah. Can't wait for someone to mention Jack Sparrow. <laughs> I think we drained Matt of all of his talent on this one episode. I think he actually has... I mean, do you have other bits? We know you have Jack Sparrow, but uh, I mean, you're pretty much done. Had a ge- German character, Hans. <laughs> German <laughs> Hans. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Speaking of other... Modern famous singer songwriter Ed Sheeran. Could you an, can you do an Ed Sheeran uh, version? Mm. You also sing a lot too. Can, are you? Do you like the guy? I do, I think he's a great songwriter actually. So yeah, I think he's I think he's good. But no, I don't. I can't. I mean, does he have a distinctive voice? I don't think. I'll, I mean, he does singing, but yeah, for sure. But talking, I don't know. Yeah, I could do Beatles though if you like. I can do every Beatle. Oh, okay, sure. They're all different. Ringo, you can do Ringo. Of course I can do Ringo, you know. He's very bouncy when he talks, you know. Oh. Uh, that's Ringo. And it sounds like he, you know, he doesn't know what he's saying, but he does, you know. And, you know, Paul McCartney's a bit like that too, bounces around. But he's a bit more upbeat and also, you know, he seems to know what he's doing. John Lennon was always very wiry in his voice, you know, when he talks. So it's very different. Yeah. I love you've got George as my favorite because George really doesn't sound like his... This is really sound like he's all there, but it's really good. He wrote so far. Here comes the sun, you know. Mm-hmm. All right. Did you know that? Pretty good. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Look what you've done, Adam. You've opened up this can of worms. You can't put the worms back in no, the can. No. I love it. 
Can you actually get cans of worms? Like, can you buy them? Oh, of course. For fishing or something, yeah. or just eating? For sure. Well, you can literally get them, and you can figuratively get the version that's a simulation, or, you know, not really the can of worms. You could buy the one for the kid, like the, the prop, you know? Oh, yeah, where the big snake flies out when you open right, it. Right, and it pops out. That's yeah. one worm, though, in it, I wouldn't say. I'd, I'd say that's a can of worm. Well, you buy more than one, it's cans of worm. Yeah, it's like attorneys general. Exactly. <laughs> I got one pick that I would like to also bring up that I learned about at Fosdem. Oh yeah, please do. And this I think is very cool. It's reviewpad.com. And this is like smarter PRs and rules around PRs. So in a lot of my projects, I like to have it such that a PR goes up and then we automatically run all the tests and everything. And only if all those tests pass and they can be back-end unit tests, they can be integration tests sometimes, they can be front-end tests, end-to-end tests, like whatever it is that gives you the confidence to release to production, you can gate the PR on that so that it doesn't go into main. So you never your main is never broken, your main branch. Well, that can be sometimes a little bit too strict, and ReviewPad lets you actually create some more nuanced rules around this. So you can say, for example, markdown files, just let them go straight to main, you can say, like, in this case, I want to I want to push to main, but I still want someone to review this at some point. So it's like still in there, it's low risk, so you want to progress, and later someone can check it. You could say things like, for all Go files, you want to make sure the entire test suite runs, because it's quick, so it's no big harm. But you can even do things like for new starters, for like different groups of people. You might say new starters, all the all everything should run for them, but the more senior people... Are, are, are have slightly more relaxed rules and they're allowed to push without all, all the checks happening. And even individual functions, you could mark a functioning code as critical. And if anything inside that changes, then it makes sure that all the tests will will run all that whole pipeline it executes before it's allowed to merge. I think this is the next level, the next generation of PRs. This is something that I mean, I don't know who owns this. This is something that I would I would expect to have in GitHub at some point. Like, this is really good. I haven't used it yet, but I do intend to. Mm. What do you think of that review pad? I like all the words that you just said about it. It's brand new to me. It sounds really cool. A glowing review from you, which which does mean a lot to me. So I'll definitely look closer at it. But I think that it's too late to start being nice to me now, Jared. <laughs> well, no one's listening anymore. <laughs> we lost him at uh, Here Comes the Sun. <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, I mean, definitely we'll check it out. I think that PRs as they stand leave a lot of things on the table, and we know there's lots of teams building things like this in order to flesh out and improve the code review process. We had a show. Last year on Graphite, which is stack diffs, uh, which plays in the same ballpark as this, but it's not exactly the same. They're not tackling it the exact same way. And I know a lot of people are enthusiastic about that. Christopher Hiller, Bone Skull on JS Party, actually gave an unsolicited Graphite shout out in his pro tip time because he's been using that and has been loving it. So that's another tool that maybe we'll just link to. But that's my thoughts on the matter. I have never seen this before this afternoon, so I have to check out more of how it does what it does, but yeah. It makes sense. I mean, it's almost as if like this could even be similar to the way you have infrastructure as code. It's almost like, you know, to main as code. I don't know. Mm. It's just like yeah. something that says like we have to have a gate on this process. And like you had said, there there's certain things that can go through, more nuanced rules, and that totally makes sense. And a one size fits all get pushed to main does not always fit. So I can see how this makes sense. It, the thing I think I question, though, is less the tool itself, more like like uh, Steve Jobs said about Dropbox. Is this just a feature or is it a product or a company? You know, I wonder if, like, in some cases, this is a great stand-up of a, of a feature that should just be GitHub proper, if that's what the majority uses. Interesting. I mean, I wonder if the strategy is like an acquisition thing. And sometimes that sometimes that's great strategy to have. You know, you've done it a couple of times, right? I mean, it's a good... Yeah. I don't know if that's been your strategy, but you've done it... Yeah, three times. Yeah. Tres. Tres. Yeah, but they weren't features. I mean, actually, I think solving one problem and doing it really well is is well worth doing. And yeah, like maybe you, you'd struggle to build a business around it. I don't know. Yeah. 
Well, that's the hard part. It's like, oh, here's this thing. Here's it's great. It's useful, but man, it it died because there's no company. It's just a feature. Yeah, so that's why we have to sponsor open source if we want to keep it alive. We can't just expect it to keep going. And, you know, we have to we have to normalize that more. We've got to do more of it. It's hard to justify sometimes, but it's important. I think it's certainly becoming more normalized, but I think as it becomes normalized, it becomes the paradox of choice. It's like, well, there's so much open source. There's so much usefulness. I can't possibly give to it all. So I either do nothing or I just don't know where to put it. And I just am just guilty. I feel guilty. Yeah, so that's interesting. I wonder if we could get some, like a heat map of usefulness of your dependencies. Actually. Yeah. How often is that code executed? Um, I would say a, a Git heat map sounds pretty cool, honestly. Yeah. Well, we could do it with observability tools. If you've got tracing and you've got like, you know, observability running in your code, you will have insights into the code paths and stuff. You probably could gather some stats on the most useful bits. That might just layer on the guilt, though, honestly. Why don't you just pay pay for the project then, if you're feeling guilty? Well, I mean, it's not me, man. It's somebody else, of course. No, I mean, I think that it's I just... Dan, Tam. That, <laughs> Dan, Tam. Dan, Tam. Pay for your project. The point you're making is great, though. We, we should support open source more. I think, you know, I always want to see more clarification on the how. You know, GitHub sponsors one answer, but, you know, it's an avenue. It's not, well, it's not like what. You know, the what becomes infinitely harder to define if you don't examine the sort the open source you use that's useful to you, you know. And then sometimes it might be corporate sponsors. It might actually be open source, but it's a company who's backing you. Well, you're going to support that thing? Well, maybe, you know, you might use it as a support, but like, they're already a company, just buy the things, you know, mm -hmm. that support them to make it, you know. There's no wrong way to support open source. I like all the words that you just said. Well, thank you. <laughs> I don't agree with your point. All right. It's a quite a compliment. Uh, that was a very, yeah. Jared, by the way, just for future reference, if someone's describing something and you like all those words, <laughs> I feel like you like the thing. I think it's safe to say, yeah, I like that. Okay, <laughs> I'll check it out. Yeah, check it out. You will like it. I just don't like to like, give you too much credit. You know, I don't like to like give you exactly what you're looking for because you 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 beg for so much. <sighs> well, let's close up with a lightning round. This has been a fun conversation, a long one. You know, way more singing than than expected or hoped for or or desired or appreciated. But a lot less than I expected. I was I was <laughs> I'm really here to do songs, and there's been a lot of talking about <laughs> Git. <laughs> yeah, we've spent a lot of time in between. <laughs> way too spent much. a lot of time in between tracks talking about Git. That's funny. Yeah, we should have changed the premise <laughs> to like Matt sings a song interspersed <laughs> with Git conversations. What a great! You'd go to that. Gig, wouldn't you? Well, you have one more chance here because we're going to do a lightning round of your brainchild on go time, unpopular opinions. And surely you can strum us out the theme song for the jingle for unpopular opinions. Can you not? Otherwise, we'll have to splice it. It's hard. We can splice it right here. Splice, splice it, yeah, I think. Oh, gosh. We're back to this again. What's the alternative? <laughs> Splice it in. <laughs> we'll splice it. I actually think you should probably leave. So for those who don't listen to Go Time, Unpopular Opinions is a regular segment where people share opinions that they think or hope or expect to be unpopular with a listening audience. And then we put those opinions out on the social medias to see if it's actually unpopular or not. Now, what we found over time is that most unpopular opinions are actually popular when it comes to polling time. But there's been a few people who have been somewhat unpopular and a few who've managed to be incredibly unpopular with their opinions. I'm actually in the top five most unpopular opinions of all time. What was it? That JS Party's better podcast than Go oh, Time. Oh, feels bad for JS Party. Which was unpopular, of course, with the Go audience. But uh, we're going to do a lightning round real quick. So, Adam, passing to you. First one. Whew. Do you have an unpopular opinion you'd like to share? I think my unpopular opinion is I don't have any unpopular opinions. I tried so hard to think about like something that is unpopular, and all I can think about is popular things. Like what? Well, 
I think if you're struggling to get something done consistently that you want to do, my unpopular opinion is that you should learn to habit stack. It's a, it's a superpower. Habit stacking is a superpower. That's right. Tell us more. But that's kind of a popular opinion if you know about habit stacking. Right. Like if you learn the, you know, the, the inner secrets, this dark secret basically. So you have habits, right? Let's say you make coffee. This is my example for me, a really simple example. I make coffee once a day when I'm at work at least, you know, maybe twice. And I wear glasses like you, Matt. I wear glasses. And as a glasses wearer, you must be upset or get upset when they're dirty. Yeah, I get furious. And especially upset if you have to have a special microfiber cloth to clean them because you can't just use your shirt. Oh. Your glasses will smudge. Yeah. Right? You f- oh, I hate dirty glasses. Now that I have a point of empathy, he can, he can understand what I'm saying. So my, my feeling is like if I'm going to have dirty glasses all day, that's just upsetting. Can't do that. Well, I will forget. I get busy. You know, I don't have this cloth in my pocket all the time. I'm going to have a stack. I'm going to make coffee and leave my cleaning cloth when I have time. There's there's steps between the the coffee making, right? You you brew the coffee. You wait for the coffee to brew. You pour it. You drink it. You stack this habit with a habit you're already doing. Right. So you, you stack a habit near another habit that you do consistently, and then you do it. Right. Okay. It's a superpower. If you can learn to do that in different ways, let's say more productively, let's say... I don't know, whenever you're running tests and you've got a minute or two and you have like three emails you can rapid fire off, then you can do them. Stack up a habit of like you need to return these emails, but you've got that minute, minute and a half, or maybe you've got a couple slight minutes just stacking up or something that can happen at three minutes. Stack a habit of good communication could be the, the habit. And the way you execute is a few simple emails, maybe a return Slack message, maybe it's a a PR review or a one-liner or whatever it might be, maybe a quick chat with ChatGPT. Who knows? I mean, just do something. Yeah. Is this just multitasking or is this more than multitasking? It sounds like you're just talking about multitasking. Because am I in the habit of... Well, I think in that case, no, no, no. Well, because if... Well, in that case, it might be blurred. But in my case, I'm like, I do have a habit. Right. And so I stack certain habits around that thing. So not only am I doing those other things, but now I think, okay, when I make coffee, neurologically, I'm thinking... I got to clean my glasses because right here's the thing. I just mm. do it. So it's a habit that forms around other habits. Now, I don't wear glasses, but I would think. Show off. What about like when you realize they're dirty? Maybe you do it then. Well, that's well. the point <laughs> is, is you always have that cleaning cloth. Oh, I got yeah. you. You know, unless you carry the, this cleaning cloth with you everywhere. And I just don't. So like if I'm deploying my code, I could floss my teeth. Well, I mean, Jared, pick your habit. I'm just saying, you know, like, if, if you got if you got issues with floss, then maybe, maybe. Yeah, but right. I, I, I kind of like in this. Uh, does, I wonder if it also works with bad habits, because, like, I feel like it, maybe you're a nose picker. Sure. D-stack. You could D-stack things. I have a cigarette. No, I don't mean to, so that you can do bad habits, Jared. That's mad. Thank you. <laughs> Every time you pick your nose, <laughs> yeah, have a cigarette. That would work, though, because you do... <laughs> sure. It works with bad habits, too. I think it does. Yeah, that's redirection. That's, I mean, so... If I understand you correctly, maybe you have a bad habit and you don't want to do it. And so when you think about the bad habit, you do a healthy habit. I like the bad habits. Though. Yeah. Right. Replace it with. Now I'm thinking like do a bad habit, like don't brush my teeth. And while I'm not brushing my teeth, I can also be not wearing deodorant, for example. So it's like cascades, doesn't it? <laughs> no, that's not. That's not. No, you want to do a positive. Second one should be positive. Well, I mean, it would have worked if you canceled it out. Like, let's say you did a bad habit. And you're like, well, since I'm bad here, I should be good, good over here. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I should have tried to do that. I thought of yeah. the deodorant yeah. thing. Like actually double up on the deodorant or something like that. Like, All right. Well, this one was going to be unpopular with me. I think it's a terrible idea. I think habit stacking's the worst. <laughs> 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 Sounds awful. Let's go to you, Matt. Do you have an unpopular opinion? Yes, I do. Yeah, I think, I think it, when we're building software, we very often focus on the wrong things like we try I, I just think we always like we're constantly doing this we don't focus on what's important i mean really you've got to solve a problem for somebody that's what you've got to do and we sometimes are so far away from that we're so abstracted from that because of process or just organization or whatever it is that we're doing the work kind of in isolation and not in the context of what we're actually where it ends up in small tools and small projects, that doesn't happen so much. And especially if you're scratching your own itch, then that's a great way for this to not happen. But when you get into bigger orgs, you know, have, understanding the why you're doing something 
is so important and everybody needs to know that everyone needs to understand it it can't just belong to just some people and they decide what everyone else is doing so i think we yeah i think we often focus on the wrong things and we're just building the wrong things and usually like sometimes it's nice to to just do a cool project and i would never want to take that away from anybody but if you're just doing cool, complicated stuff because you love it or it's satisfying to do and it's a hard problem and you're solving it, then that's one thing. But you can maybe, if you can solve a problem for somebody with a script or just a, something much simpler, if there's even just a tool already that kind of solves the problem, like, yeah, I feel like we don't enough, especially because we're, we're there to build software, we should remember there are other things in our tool belt and try and just focus on solving the problem and do whatever it takes to, to solve a problem for a person. That, and, and try and know who the person is. Try and meet them if you can. If it's not you, to try and meet the person. So that's my unpopular opinion. Hmm. This just sounds like good advice, man. This doesn't oh, sound like yeah. unpopular opinion. It's like I agree with everything you say there. Yeah. Who's going to disagree with that? Well, you agree with how you execute. What you may not agree with is that we're – you said what we're doing it all wrong, basically, or something like that. You were focused on the wrong things. I think most people are most people are doing it wrong. Most people, yeah. I think like like ninety oh. percent of us are building software wrong because we aren't obsessed with that. So yeah, it needs a sound bite, doesn't it? Okay, that's a little stronger way of saying it. There's your sound bite. Okay. Well, I agree with connection and the you know meeting the people that you're solving the problem for. That's like key. You should do that for sure. Here's an actual unpopular opinion. Now that we've heard your guys' lame ones, here's a real mm. unpopular opinion. And I know this is going to be unpopular because I've said it before and people haven't liked it. Oh. So I'm going to say it again. Here we go. And see if people like it. Automagically? Yeah. You know the word? Automagically? That's a <laughs> dumb word. Why? We shouldn't use it. <laughs> I don't like that word at all. To me, it says, I have no idea how this works. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, nobody else does either. And I'm hoping the fact that no, that nobody knows how it works is good enough to impress everybody. So you ask somebody, how does that work? And they say, well, it's automagical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're supposed to be all be like, oh, okay, it's automagical. <laughs> Yay. And then move on. No, it means you don't actually know. If you knew, you just explain how it worked. Because when you know how software works, it's not magic, is it? No. But counterpoint, it means you don't have to know how it works. You could just use it. It works. And you, and you don't have to know. Ah, you know what else means that? It's automatic. Mm. We already have a word for that. It just works automatically. Oh, okay. It just does it automatically. Why does it have to be mad? Why do we have to pull magic into it? I don't know about that, Jared. No. Nah. Let's push back a little bit. You, neither one of you agree with me? I'm telling you, this is an unpopular yeah, opinion. This could be. <laughs> okay. Because you guys don't like uh, this. Message received. Got it. So automatically describes a process that's too complex, whereas automatically is just, there's no complexity in there. The magically with auto makes the thing that you don't know how it works that's too complex, you explain it that way. Automatically doesn't simply describe something that's automagical, that's too complex, and you don't know how it works. I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree. That explanation was not automagical enough. Uh, it's just like a, it's just a spin. It's a bad spin on something okay. that could could be explained. Do you believe in magic? Mm, what kind of magic? Slide of hand. Well, do you believe in magic? Gonna, are you going to break into song here? No. Uh, I believe in sleight of hand, like I in magic tricks. Yeah. You can't not believe in sleight of hand. Is there? A, well, is, that's why I don't understand the question. Do I believe in magic? Is there a group out there like the flat earthers that are just like, no, we deny sleight of hand. They, if anything, they believe <laughs> well, in I'm magic, really sure don't they? Because they, they think it's not sleight of hand. Right. That's right. I just don't understand the question then. Well, I was going to bring in a song, but you ruined it. <laughs> well, I did everybody a service but there. Do you, if, I mean, if you can somewhat agree that magic exists to some degree, like things happen that are very complex, that we don't know how they work. I mean, not literal magic, but like a version of things happening. Okay. Do I believe in the unexplainable? Absolutely. Okay. So that's a version of magic. Do I believe that there's software that's completely unexplainable? Well, it shouldn't be. Like if you know your systems, maybe it means I don't want to explain it to you. What is the context of this word being used that you, that you like loathe? Engineers say it all the time. They, and Who says it? engineers and we put it on our marketing like and then it automatically just works and you're like nah this is marketing lingo 
you're spinning you're spinning me i don't like it it's a dumb word gotcha i don't like spin okay don't spin me <laughs> there was actually a there was actually a book about spin selling i used to i grew up in sales right like my my origination into professionalism was in sales and there's a book called spin selling look it up you can tell you're in sales because you just said my origination into professionalism. <laughs> yeah, that's some spin right there. <laughs> my first job. My, try my first job I was in sales. <laughs> yeah, that was an automagical saying. Wow. That's funny. Yeah, I know. I mean, Matt, I'm yeah. sure you've said it. I used to say it as well when I was a younger oh, yeah. person. A lot of people love that term, automagical, and I've just gone, I've gone sour on it. So it's unpopular. It's, it's really? not a popular opinion. I just didn't know it was that popular of a word. All right, listener, uh, let us know. It, do you agree? There's three opinions here. Which one is the worst? <laughs> Which one is the worst? <laughs> it's going to be mine. <laughs> it's going to be mine. <laughs> Can we clarify that was not, Matt, you were making fun, were you? What? Were you making fun? No, that's a standard German accent. That was just your being funny, doing an accent, right? Like, yeah. What do you mean? I was well. Okay, good. I just want to clarify <laughs> yeah, that. I mean, right here at the end of the show, I want to clarify that because that, yeah, that okay. just for a little while there just sat so wrong with me. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I almost said something. I almost stopped the show. It should if you feel like that. Absolutely. I mean, I I celebrate like different accents. I really love them. Yeah. And so yeah, impersonating accents is like a fun hobby. But I was so close, man. My white towel was like. Whoa. You're gonna throw in the white towel. You know, it was so close. No one. As a go at Liam Neeson on my watch. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, though. Hang on. It's okay to do a British accent, isn't it? Everyone does a British accent. I don't. I can't. Like, they, I yeah, can't. You have, Jared, because I've heard you do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, try, I try not to. I, mean, I don't mind. Because <laughs> I'm not good at it. No. I like it. I think accents are all in good fun. I think... I think just the, the length of that, the length of the well, read... As you went on, it became more and more caricature. Well, I think we made it clear that it was in good fun. If not, so I'm joking about th- you know any of the show as you may know. I don't know if you knew that was I. I was kidding around about stopping the show. No, I wasn't going to stop the show. I was just being funny. But it's a nice point, actually. It's a nice point because if somebody felt insulted by that, I would I would be devastated genuinely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I want to clarify that. Like we were not trying to be insulting. No, we're not trying to be. Just just natural. Just talent. Natural talent. It's just who he is. How how and when how and when do we end this? Never. I'm thinking like five minutes ago, probably. Yeah. <laughs> probably. <laughs> when I try to say goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. I don't know. Thanks, Matt. It's over Thanks now. For your, thanks for joining us for your final episode. Well, you know what we could do, Jared? We can play that song. It's closing time. Mm. Tell me remember this. Yeah, Semi Sonic. Semi Sonic. Of course. I saw them live. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Right. They were playing that song for us. Oh, yeah. When we were trying to do Beyond Code the first season. In that bar, we're like, we're trying to wrap up the last two interviews here. Come on, people. Yeah. So we were at an after party at a conference, Matt. And this was uh, Keep Ruby Weird, maybe? Keep Ruby Weird, yeah. Keep Ruby Weird. 2014. At the after party, the DJ turned on closing time at 930. The party ended at 10. So, you know, naturally what you do then, if you're a terrible DJ, is you loop it. So he started looping closing time at 930. It played literally for a half an hour. Maybe someone had his kids. Are you trying to do Liam Neeson again? Maybe someone had his kids, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, we couldn't even record our video show because it was just closing time was too loud in the background. Oh. It was it was terrible. That's so rude. Oh my god. Closing <laughs> time. Open all the doors and let you Yeah, I don't know it. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay yeah, here. Let... I don't remember that part. Closing time. Turn all the lights on every boy, every girl. Yeah. Closing time. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Well, you do not have to go anywhere. You can stay right here. I allow you. I want you to. I want you to stick around to the very end of the show because, hey, this was a fun show. It was fun to have Matt back on the Change Law podcast. It has literally been too long. So, Matt, thank you for dousing us with all of your song, all of your humor, all of the fun. Thank you for being a friend. It was fun having you. 
And to you listeners, thank you also for being a friend. Thank you for listening to the show. It is an awesome experience to produce this show for you all every single week. And I thank you. I thank you. And speaking of thanks, a big, massive thank you to Fastly, Fly, and also a new partner of ours coming out very soon, TypeSense. Yes, we are using TypeSense Cloud to power our search. We have some fun plans planned with Jason and team from TypeSense. So stay tuned for that. And a big, big thank you to the Beatmaster in residence, Breakmaster Cylinder. Those beats are banging, banging, banging. Thank you, BMC. Thank you very much. But that's it. It is officially closing time. But hey, we got about 45 seconds of song left. So stick around. Enjoy those beats, and we'll see you on Monday.